In the last section, we looked at, at density and mass of objects. And um, in this section, we want to use that material in a crucial way and talk about the concept of, center of mass, centers of mass. Um, that includes something called moments, but moments are really kind of a, something that we deal with just so that we can talk about part of the calculation of the center of mass. Um, what's the center of mass? Well, and why do we need the notion? We frequently talk about point masses. We talk about, oh, an object of mass m is at this point in space. Well, a real solid object takes up an infinite number of points in space, but we're kind of imagining like a particle or something with something that's effectively zero dimensional. It's just like a point that has some mass. In fact, we frequently don't even say an object of mass m. We just say a mass. Um, why, why isn't that satisfactory? Well, because real objects have, occupy many points in space. And in a lot of physical problems, like when you're dealing with gravity, if you talk about the force of gravitational attraction, the magnitude of the force, it's the universal gravitational constant g times one mass times the other mass divided by the distance squared between the objects. But the objects have many points. What do you mean, the distance between the objects? What does that even mean? It's, uh, you know, there are a whole bunch of points. You could talk about any distances. What's meant is the distance between their centers of mass. And the center of mass is a point that you calculate for an object or a collection of objects, a system of masses. It's, um, for a lot of physical problems, it's where you can imagine all the mass is concentrated. For a, for a rigid wire or a thin metal plate, the center of mass would be where you would put your finger to, to make it balance. I, I have a, <laughs> a demo. Um, so here's, here's a, a spoon. And, and I put my finger there to make the spoon balance. Notice my finger isn't anywhere close to halfway along the spoon. It's way down towards this end. And why is that? Well, you might think it's because half the mass needs to be on this side and half the mass needs to be on the other side. In fact, we'll see that that's not what's going on. It's true that you do need to kind of balance out the mass on each side, but in fact, mass that's further away from this balancing point counts more than mass that's closer in, um, and we'll see that. And that's the concept of moment, the, the kind of x-coordinate, or at least for a one-dimensional object, kind of the x-coordinate from of, of a point times how much mass is there. And we really weight, we really kind of, multi, well, we multiply the x-coordinate times how much mass is located there and add those together and divide by the total mass, as we'll see. Um, you might wonder why the concept is not like that of balance, making half the mass on one side and half the mass on the other. If you've ever played on a seesaw or seen two kids on a seesaw, one of them can be much heavier than the other one, so way more, so have bigger mass. Um, one of them can be much heavier as long as the lighter child sits farther away from the balancing point, the fulcrum. Um, so the, um, that's what we're after is the notion of center of mass. Um, the center of mass, if the density, as we'll see, for a, a solid object, it's, you need the density of the object, like, like we looked at in the last section, to uh, make a calculation of the center of mass. Um, if the density of an object is constant, the center of mass is, uh, as we'll see, the, the actual what the density is drops out of the calculation. It cancels out as long as you know, there's some density that's constant. And um, we'll see that it cancels out, and so the center of mass is then just a property of the geometric shape of the object. And in that context, the center of mass is referred to as the centroid of the object. So the centroid is a geometric point that is the same as the center of mass as long as the object has constant density. All right, I want to give you the uh, physics kind of intuition and explanation for why the center of mass is located where it is. So that explanation, 
I'm going to actually talk about a finite number of point masses. And then when we come to continuous problems, like, uh, rid like wires or thin metal plates or solid objects, of course, we'll do what we always do in integral calculus. We chop things up into little pieces, approximate how much mass is there, and do what we do for a finite number of point masses and get an approximation and add that up. You get a Riemann sum, you take a limit of Riemann sums, you get an integral. But we'll talk about, we'll carry out the discussion infinitesimally as we have been for a while. So what happens? Suppose you've got a finite number of point masses. So we have these objects, but we'll just call them point masses, sitting in space. And I'll draw three of them, but assume we've got n of them. m sub 1 through m sub n. And I am going to use vector terminology again for the position vector and acceleration as we did back in the section on total distance traveled in space. Um, but it shouldn't be too bad. And in the, I will break it down into x coordinates, y coordinates, and z coordinates so you don't have to use vectors in the end. So assume you have these in point masses, and each mass is being acted on by some force, which is a vector quantity. So I'm just drawing force vectors in kind of random positions. I don't care which way they're going. So you have in forces acting on each of the particles. So Fi equals the force acting on m sub i, where i could be any integer between 1 and n. Um, and r i, oh, this, this can change with time, so it's a function of time. And r i, this is the position, so it's a vector quantity, the position vector of m i. <clears throat> All right, we have Newton's second law of motion, which says that the sum of the forces acting on an object equals the mass times the acceleration. Acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time. So Newton's second law tells us tells us that Fi, the force acting on the ith point mass, is that amount of mass times the acceleration, which is the second derivative of the, velocity, of the position vector with respect to time. <coughs> so this is what Newton's second law gives us for each individual particle, or for each individual point mass. But suppose now that we want to think of all of the masses as one object. You think of them as, you could call it one system of masses, or you could think of them as being very close together, so almost indistinguishable from one object. So that we think of these. So now, now consider M1 and Mn as one mass, or you can say system of masses, but think of it as one, one mass. One, how about one object of mass, so that the English is better? One object of mass, well, the sum of all the masses. Of mass, I'll write capital M, the sum all of the masses of the individual objects. So M1 through Mn. So suppose I do that. I think of all of these masses together as one thing. 
And that one thing would have mass, this capital M. Well, the force, the force acting on this thing that we're now thinking of as one object, the total force acting on this, I'll call it this big object, or the, maybe the, on the total object, is, well, the sum of the forces. So it's capital F, I won't put a subscript on it, so it's the sum of all the Fi's. It's a vector quantity, and of course it changes with, could change with time. So you add up all of the forces. Great. So what? Well, if we want to treat, if we want to treat the entire collection of objects as though they're one mass, then we want that one object to obey Newton's second law. We want We want that F, the sum of the forces acting now on this total object, is its mass times the acceleration. But acceleration is, you know, it's, it's the second derivative with respect to time of some position. But a position is an individual point in space, and this, I'll write, r sub cm, we want this vector, this position vector, we want that where this r cm is the position vector well it's the position vector of a point that as far as Newton's second law goes plays the role of where all this mass is concentrated. And so that's what we call the center of mass. That position is the position vector of the center of mass. So this is what we want. What does this mean that RCM has to be? Well. For each fi, we have this. I'm going to move the mi. It, mi is a constant. I'm assuming the masses are constant. I didn't say that, but I meant it. Um, since it's a constant, I can move it next to the ri, so I can move it inside the derivative since differentiation is linear. So fi is the second derivative with respect to t of mi times the vector ri. I want to add these so that I get the sum of the fi here. So f, the big vector f, is the sum as i goes from 1 to n of each of the f sub i's. So it's the sum of all of these. But again, the derivative is linear. I can pull summations inside. So it's the second derivative with respect to t of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of m i r i. But we want f equals capital M times the second derivative with respect to t of a position vector. So what do I do? Mathematician stupid trick number two. Stupid trick number one is add zero in a clever way. Stupid trick uh, sorry, stupid trick, yeah, number one, add zero in a clever way. Stupid trick number two, multiply by one in a clever way. And today's clever way of multiplying by one is to multiply on the outside by the constant capital M, the sum of the mass. But then I have to divide by capital M somewhere, and I'm going to do that inside this quantity right here. So, if I do that, what happens? I get that the total force acting on our total object 
is the total mass times the second derivative with respect to t of this quantity. The sum of each individual mass times its position divided by this constant that's the total mass. This quantity is known as the center of mass. So R sub CM, which if the, if the masses are moving, this could be a function of time, but that doesn't matter. At any time, it's the sum of the masses times the position of that mass, all divided by the total mass, which is the sum of the mi's. I could put that back. Um, in fact, maybe I will. This is the sum as i goes from 1 to n of the mi's, right, the total mass. This is the center of mass. It's not, from this equation, from the fact that we want this equation to be true, it doesn't follow that RCM has to be exactly that, because we're taking the second derivative. If we had a constant times, a constant vector times t plus a constant, it would have the same second derivative and still satisfy this equation. But it's true, I'm not going to derive it, but that if we want the center of mass to to also give us the position of, of one of these individual masses if all of the other masses are zero, if we want that to happen at all times, if all the masses are zero except for one, the center of mass is where that one mass is, then it means that that constant vector times t plus constant vector that you might add both have to be zero, and this is where the center of mass has to be. All right. So, um, this is what we'll use for the center of mass. It's, um, it's a vector quantity, but of course you can just break the vector up into its x, y, and z components if you don't like vectors. Um, if you don't want to use vectors, after all this is a single variable calculus course, we're not supposed to use vectors too much. So the x component of the center of mass. Let me just start writing COM for center of mass so that I don't have capital C and capital M, little o, so I don't have to keep writing that over and over again. The X component of the center of mass, <coughs> frequently written X bar. Some people would reserve X bar for when the density is constant, um, although we're talking about point masses, but some people would reserve this for the notion of centroid. I do not x bar, the x component of the center of mass. Well, it just means you pick out the x component in each of your vectors. So what it means is that this is the sum, as i goes from 1 to n, of, um, of mi times xi over the sum of the mi's. And the same, the analogous thing for the y component and the z component. The y component of the center of mass, you put y bar, you'd have y's here. And the z component of the center of mass, you'd have a z bar and zi there. Um, understand, you know, we you try not to memorize things in isolation. You try to understand what they are. In the denominator, you have the total mass. In the numerator, you have, well, each mass is kind of weighted, although it's a little bad to say mass and weighted because you might think of the weight of the mass, but it's multiplied by its coordinate, its x-coordinate. Um, so mass with bigger x-coordinates contribute more to this. That's what I was saying at the beginning about balancing the spoon on my finger. Mass that's further, farther away from where my finger is counts more. Um, this numerator is so that we can have a term for it. And we'll, we talk about calculating the total mass. And calculating, we want to have a phrase that it's what we call this numerator. Lots of people call this different things. They all include the term moment. I would, the technical, technically this is the x component of the mass moment.
about the origin. However, so we don't like saying all of that. And the only kind of moment we're going to look at is mass moment. So I'll just say the x component of the moment. And we're only going to look about moments, components of moments about the origin, although we could talk about components about axes, um, the, the moments about axes. That terminology and notation gets a little confusing. So I'm just going to call this the x component of the moment and even leave out the phrase about the origin since we're not going to deal with any other so that we don't have to say too much every time. So similar, uh, of course, analogously, the y component of the center of mass is y bar and then the y component of the moment divided by the total mass and same thing for the z component. All right, how do you actually calculate this? Um, well, if you actually have a finite number of point masses, you do this. But what we're interested in is the calculus problem of you've got some continuous object and you want to know, okay, how do you take this finite number of, we call them discrete pieces of data and decide what you would do when you have a continuous object? Well, let's, let's look at a wire. So suppose you have, let's, as we did in last section. Suppose you have a wire, which we think of as a one-dimensional object. And we'll assume it's laid out along the x-axis somewhere between some x equals a and x equals b. And as in the last section, the data that we want, we want to be given so I'll assume these are, that these are measured, that x is measured in meters, I'll, just so we can have some units. Um, then we want the length density at each point of the wire, delta sub L of x, the length density. So this would be in kilograms per square meter. Then how do we use what we just looked at for a finite number of point masses to decide how you calculate the center of mass of this wire given the length density function? That's, it's not difficult. You think of chopping the wire up into a finite number of pieces so then you think that those are a finite number of masses, but they're not located at points. But in each interval, you would pick a point where you approximate all of that mass as being located. You calculate the x moment using that data, or approximate it, divide by the total mass, which we talked about how to calculate in the last section. And then you take the limit of that process as you chop the wire into smaller and smaller pieces. Of course, we're going to discuss this infinitesimally. So you have your wire, and you're at a given x coordinate, and you take an infinitesimal little length dx. And you're at some x coordinate. You take an infinitesimal little length of wire dx the infinitesimal mass of that infinitesimal length of wire is, by definition of length density, it's the length density times dx. So that's how much mass is at that point. The contribution to the x component of the moment, and there's only an x component because we're looking at something that we're thinking of as being one dimensional. So we're only interested in the x component. The this is the x component of the moment from this one piece. Right, you take how much mass is there times its x coordinate, just like we did in the finite number of point mass case, x component of the moment. Oh, but dm is, is delta sub l times dx. So this is just 
you break these problems up into pieces. This is x times delta L dx. And what do we want to do? The x coordinate of the center of mass is you would integrate as x goes from a to b. So that's adding up all of the x components of the moment. So you add up all the x coordinates times how much mass is there. So it's x dm. And you divide by the integral from a to b of, well, you add up all the little chunks of mass to get the total mass. So you can write this. It's easy to remember. It looks just like our summation formula, except we don't have m sub i and x sub i. We just have x and dm. And instead of summations, we have integrals. But aside from that, it looks the same. And then you write dm in terms of the length density function. So this is the integral from a to b of x times delta sub l of x dx divided by the integral from a to b of delta sub l dx. So, yeah, if you remember the formula for the center of mass of a finite number of point masses, then the integral version should be pretty clear. And then if you put that together with your knowledge of how you calculate these infinitesimal little blobs of mass from the last section, then, yeah, you know, it's not, you don't have to memorize this as a separate thing. It just uh, follows from our work before. I should say something, there's a big th mistake that people make. There's a delta sub L of X here and a delta sub L of X here. In general, you cannot cancel those. They're inside the integral. There's no way, no algebra that lets you cancel this and this. However, in the case where you're interested in the centroid, so the case where the density is constant, if the density is constant, you can pull out then it's some constant. Constants you can pull out of integrals. You can pull out delta L here, pull out delta here, L here, and then cancel them. But that's only if delta L is constant. Um, and then they'd cancel. Um, and, and then the centroid, you know, the center of mass, something of constant density, only depends on the shape. Now, <laughs> we're going to verify this right now, but if you had a thin wire, so you have this wire between A and B, and the density is constant, hopefully you know where the center of mass is um, you know, without doing any math. Just, just from symmetry, the sake of symmetry, it would be in the middle. The midpoint between A and B is A plus B over 2. So the centroid, the center of mass, assuming constant density, better come out to be at A plus B over 2. Um, let's check that that happens. <coughs> <clears throat> so, um, <laughs> is the centroid of a wire, but really I mean an idealized one-dimensional thing, at the midpoint. Well, it better be, or something's not working right. So, but let's verify it. So, what would we do? We would calculate x bar. It would be the integral from a to b, or it is the integral from a to b, of x delta l of x dx over the integral from a to b of delta l dx. But we're assuming by saying that we're looking for the centroid, that this is a constant, and greater than zero because it's a, it's a density, but that won't be relevant in what we're about to do, other than it's not zero, so we're not dividing by zero. If delta L is a constant, you pull this out, and you bring delta L out here. If delta L is a constant, you pull this out, you bring it out here. And now, delta L divided by delta L. Now there's no integral in between. Those really do cancel each other. And we have to calculate this. Well, the integral 
of 1 dx is just x evaluated from a to b. The integral of x, you use the power rule, you add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, x squared over 2 evaluated from a to b. This is b squared over 2 minus a squared over 2 divided by b minus a, and you might think, wow, that's not giving us what we want. Oh, yes it is. Factor out the 1 half. This is b squared minus a squared over b minus a. And then factor this as the difference of squares. This is b minus a times b plus a. The b minus a's cancel. And you're left with 1 half of b plus a. Yes, that is the midpoint of the wire. Phew. Good. All right. But <coughs> let's look at a problem where the link density is not constant. In fact, I want to look at a problem that we looked at in the last section, um, but now find the center of mass. So, here's an example. We'll have a wire, or we had a wire, between x equals 0 and x equals 4. And then I was using English units, so feet. And we had a length density function that was e to the minus x slugs <laughs> per foot. Um, yes, that's what we had. And the question is, where is x bar? All right, we actually calculated, well, I, we didn't do the separate calculation of the total mass of this in the last section. We calculated the mass of the left half and the right half. Um, so I will do it again, especially because it's easy. So the total mass, so actually we don't have any partial masses. I'll just say the mass of the wire. It's the integral from 0 to 4 of the length density times little thing, chunks of length, right? This is slugs per foot. You multiply by feet, you end up with slugs. This will give you the total mass. It's the integral from 0 to 4 of e to the minus x dx. That is minus e to the minus x. We've looked at that a bunch of times at this point. Um, you make the substitution, u is minus x, and that's what you get. Um, and you evaluate as x goes from 0 to 4. So we get minus e to the minus 4 minus minus what you get at 0, so plus, or minus what you get at 0, but that's a minus 1, so plus 1. So the total mass is 1 minus e to the minus 4. All right? We need to calculate the x moment, the numerator, of the, cent in the fraction that gives us the center mass. So let's do that. This will require us to integrate by parts. Always good to practice with parts, even though it's an integral we've done several times by parts. We'll do it again, quickly. So the x moment, or the x component of the moment, is the integral from 0 to 4 of x times delta L delta sub L of x dx. So that's the integral from 0 to 4 of x e to the minus x dx. Um, so let me, once again, calculate the indefinite integral, and then we'll use this calculation. So how do you find an antiderivative, or the most general antiderivative, x times e to the minus x? The nicest thing to do is integration by parts. You let u be x. That leaves dv as e to the minus x dx. Then once this is u and this is dv, this is the integral of u dv, and integration by parts says this is u times v minus the integral of v du. So we have u and dv. What we need is v and du. Well, if u is x, du is dx, that's easy. 
And if dv is this, v is the integral of that. But as we just said a minute ago, this is minus e to the minus x. You can put in a plus c, but we essentially never do that when integrating by parts. We need some v that works, not the most general one. So you get <clears throat> u times v. So that will be negative x times e to the minus x. u times v minus the integral of v. You need to be careful with all these minus signs, du, which is dx. You get a minus minus, that's a plus, and then you have to integrate e to the minus x again, which gives you another minus e to the minus x. So what we end up with is minus x e to the minus x minus e to the minus x plus a constant. <clears throat> That's the general antiderivative. What we need is just one of them <coughs> to calculate this by the fundamental theorem. And so we take minus x e to the minus x minus e to the minus x. We don't bother putting in the plus c. Evaluate from 0 to 4. So we plug in x is 4. We get minus 4 e to the minus 4 minus e to the minus 4 minus what you get at 0. It's zero, this part is zero, and this part is minus one. So we end up with minus minus, that's a plus one, minus four e to the minus fourth, minus another e to the minus fourth. This is one minus five e to the minus fourth. So this is the x component of the moment, which is the only component, because we're looking at a one-dimensional object. We found the total mass, so at this point, x-bar, x-coordinate of the center of mass, x-bar is the x-component of the center of mass. That is the x-component of the moment. divided by the mass, and what we found is this is 1 minus 5 e to the minus 4 over, over 1 minus e to the minus 4. The units here, these have length units. It's the x-coordinate, um, so feet. We were using feet. So this is I will cheat. I know it's approximately 1, but if I want a better approximation than that, put it in your calculator. This is approximately 0.92537 uh, feet. So very close to the left end, or well, a quarter of the way from the left end. All right. Um, that's how you calculate centers of mass of a uh, of a continuous one-dimensional object given a link density function. We'd like to move on to how do you find centers of mass of thin metal plates, so lamina, so an idealized two-dimensional object. So what do you do? Well, we looked at how you would calculate the mass of such a thing given an area density function in the last section. So let me recall what we did, but add one slightly different thing. So before, I didn't describe it as a region trapped between the graphs of two curves, but now I will. Suppose I've got the graphs of two functions where f of x is always greater than or equal to g of x, and I'm assuming they're continuous so that Nice. They have integrals, Riemann integrals. And I'm looking at some thin metal plate that occupies the region between those two graphs. So I'm looking at this. <clears throat> and we want to give ourselves an area density function. So this is area density. As we did in the last section, and as in the last section, I've written as a function of x, what we mean is at each x-coordinate, we to do this with one variable calculus, we need to assume that at 
each x coordinate at all the points, well, really in the cross sectional line <coughs> here at that x coordinate, that all the points along that line have, that, have the same area density, that the area density can vary as x varies, but for a fixed x, all the area densities are the same. And I've written, drawn here a thickened up cross section of kind of thickness, so width dx at x coordinate x. So what did we find? Well, in the last section, I was referring to this height as h of x, so the height of this infinitesimal rectangle. That h of x would now be f of x minus g of x. There's a reason we want to write it that way. Um, but so let's look at um, let's look at then how you would calculate the mass well, and the moments, the x and y components of the moment, so that we can just divide to get the x and y components of the center of mass. So um, we know how to find the mass. We did this in the last section. You would take so the mass of this plate, then you would integrate as x goes from a to b. Well, you add up all the infinitesimal little blobs of mass. But what's a little blob of mass? It's the area density, which we've written as a function of x, times how much area is there. Uh, let me keep writing x equals a and x equals b, times dA, a little blob of area. But what's a little blob of area? It's the height times a little change in x. And the height now is f of x minus g of x. So what we get is the integral from a to b of delta sub a of x times f of x minus g of x times dx. Don't, don't let this confuse you. Break the problems up into pieces. Oh, yes. A little chunk of mass, it's density times area density times a little chunk of area. What's a little chunk of area? It's the height times a little change in x. Yeah, you know, just think of the problems in pieces. So that's fine. Um, so let me write that where it's not so crammed in the side of the board. So what we're getting for the mass is that it's the integral from a to b. the area density function times f of x minus g of x times dx. Great. The x component of the moment. This is easy for us. I, I should write, I wrote that that's the total mass. Of course, it's the sum of all the infinitesimal blobs of mass. So really, what we're saying here is dm is is delta a of x times f of x minus g of x times dx. And then, of course, the total mass, you add up all the infinitesimal little blobs of mass. Why am I saying that again? Because what's the x component of the moment? Well, it's you add up x coordinates times how much how much mass is at that x component um, but dm is that so you just multiply x times that and take the integral so you just get the integral from a to b of x times dm but dm is this So you get that. And to get the x component of the center of mass, so x bar, you would just take this and divide by this. All right? It's the y component of the moment that takes a little more thought. So you look at this, and you go, OK, 
What's the problem? The y component of the moment should just be this should just be why don't you just write okay yeah we want things in terms of x let x go from a to b and you just take the y coordinate times dm well we can't do this why can't we do this because of this. Our, our dm is the infinitesimal little amount of mass in a vertical strip. Right? This is at dm, which is our density function times dA. It's, it's the mass of all the, the infinitesimal mass in this vertical strip. There's not one fixed y-coordinate to pick. Back up here, we were looking at you know, vertical strips that are given x-coordinates. So for each strip, there's one x-coordinate. But there are an infinite number of y-coordinates in that vertical strip. So what, what y-coordinate do we put there? Well, the answer is, because we're assuming the density is constant in x, by symmetry, or by our calculation for the wire earlier, since the density is constant, we know that the y-coordinate of the center of mass of this strip is right in the middle. So I'm going to write that as y-bar at that x-coordinate. So y-bar sub x. Uh, that doesn't look like it's in the middle. We know where the y-coordinate of the center of mass of that strip is. Where we can think of all of that mass as being concentrated as far as the y-coordinate goes. So I'm going to write that as y sub bar at that x-coordinate. It's the halfway point. But this y-coordinate is y equals f of x. And this y-coordinate is y equals g of x. Halfway in between, you add that and that, divide by 2. So this is f of x plus g of x over 2 this y bar sub x. And that is what goes here. Not, you know, it's this y bar sub x. <coughs> so what we end up with <coughs> and should you memorize what we're going to end up with? Really, no. It, it would be best if you thought about it every time. Now, of course, if you do enough problems with this, you'll come to remember it without having made a point of memorizing it. But the y component, component of the moment is this integral as x goes from a to b of these y bar at each x times how much mass is at that x coordinate. So, and our expression for dm doesn't change, but this is f of x plus g of x divided by 2, and then dm, it's a little bit, it's the area density times a little chunk of area, the little chunk of area is the height times dx. We have the same expression for dm that we had before. It's just got this expression for the y coordinate of the center of mass of the thin strip at x. What usually happens, and it completely disguises how we derive this, which you, the formulas you usually see in books, here's f of x plus g of x, here's f of x minus g of x. You can combine those using the difference of squares. And so what you see in most books, although I'll say it again, this completely disguises where it comes from, is the integral from a to b of delta sub a of x, this, and then there's f of x squared minus g of x squared divided by 2. Yes, it's true this is what you get, but it looks a little mysterious once you write it that way. Where would you get this difference of squares from? But 
we just described that. So um, let's do a let's do a problem. Using this, uh, I have to erase most of my formulas because I don't have unlimited board space, but they're not hard to remember. All right. Um, actually, maybe I'll record the formulas that we've arrived at up here so that I can refer to them while I'm working. So the, the total mass that we're getting is the integral from A to B of delta AX times little chunks of, of area, area density times little chunk of area. The X component of the moment is the integral from A to B of X times that same integrand and the complicated one is the Y component of the moment And what we just found is that this is the integral from A to B of delta AX times F squared of X minus G squared of X over 2 DX. All right. So now let's do a problem. Let's. Suppose, so example, suppose we take y equals x squared and we take y equals 1 and we look, go out, so these will intersect where x is 1 and y is 1. And let's go out to where x is 2. And let's suppose we have this kind of curvy triangular region. And it's a thin metal plate. And that its area density function is just x kilograms per square meter. So I'm assuming all my length units are in meters. And that I have, this is some thin metal plate. And its area density function just depends on x, and it is x. So at this corner, the density is 1 kilogram per square meter. Everywhere along this line, the area density is 2 kilograms per square meter. Let's find the x and y components of the center of mass. OK, we need the total mass. So, so first of all, the mass itself is just the integral as x goes from 1 to 2 of our area density function, x, times little blobs of area. Little blobs of area, you take uh, the height. So this y-coordinate minus this y-coordinate, so x squared minus 1. Times an infinitesimal thickness. <clears throat> so here's our area density function times a little blob of area. Um, that gives you dm, a little blob of mass. How do you calculate this? You just multiply those together, use the power rule twice. We get x cubed minus x dx. So that's x to the fourth over 4 minus x squared over 2, evaluated from 1 to 2. At 2, you get 16 over 4, so that's 4. Um, minus 4 over 2, so that's 2. Minus what you get at 1, which is a fourth minus a half. 
So you get two, and then this is minus a fourth. This is minus a fourth, so plus a fourth. So we get two plus a fourth. So that's eight fourths plus a fourth. That is nine fourths units. This is the mass. We're in the metric system. Nine fourths kilograms. All right. And then we need to calculate the moments. So the x component of the moment Well, it's the integral from 1 to 2. We have the exact same integral we had, except we have to multiply times an extra x in the integrand. So what we had before was just x times x squared minus 1. Now we'll have an, x, an extra x times that. So we have x times x times x squared minus 1 dx. So this is the integral from 1 to 2 of uh, x to the fourth minus x squared dx. So this is x to the fifth over 5 minus x cubed over 3, evaluated from 1 to 2. This is 32 fifths minus 8 thirds. And you subtract what you get at 1, which is a fifth minus a third. The units here are, yeah, the units on the moment, it's uh, distance units, so meters, times little blobs of mass. So this is in kilogram meters, not kilograms per meter, kilograms times meters. But then you divide by the mass, so you divide by kilograms, and you end up with meters. Um, so that's the x component. I could simplify this. I'm not going to. Um, well, maybe I will, just so we can kind of have an idea of where the x-coordinate of the center of mass is. So let me, let me do that. So, um, yeah, so let's simplify this. This is, a common denominator would be 15th. So this is 96 15th minus, right, multiply by numerator and denominator by 3. Multiply the numerator and denominator by 5, minus 40 fifteenths. And then minus, I'll get rid of these parentheses, minus a fifth, but that's minus 3 fifteenths, minus minus plus 5 fifteenths. So what do we end up with? Here we get 56, so I'm just going to look at the numerators for a second. You get 56. Um, minus 3, so that's 53, plus 5, 58 fifteenths. This is kilogram meters. All right. Um, OK, so that's the x component of the center mass. What's x bar? It is the 58 fifteenths kilogram meters divided by the total mass, which is 9 fourths of a kilogram. And so what we end up with, you invert, multiply, you end up with 4 ninths times 58 fifteenths meters. All right. Where is this approximately without a calculator? very roughly. That's about 60. So this is about 4. Um, and this is about a half. So it's roughly at x equals 2. But how rough is that? Well, that means that the, the x-coordinate of the center of mass is very close to this edge over here. How close? Well, we'd actually have to work it out. But it's not surprising that it's over here. Not only is this very far over here, not only is the height bigger over here so that there's kind of more area, but the area density is much bigger over here. So certainly the center, the x component of the center of mass is far beyond the midpoint, but it's coming out very close to the being actually two. Well, I say very close. It's 
fairly close. All right, the y coordinate of the center of mass. Um, we need the y component of the moment. The y component of the moment, what changes here? Well, what changes is whether you have this formula memorized or sitting in front of you on the board like I do, or whether you realize that what changes is you put the y component, or the y coordinate of the center of mass of each strip there, which is f of x plus g of x, so it's x squared plus 1. One way or the other, you should arrive at this integral. You should arrive at this integral, which is, this is x. Our f of x, our top function, is x squared, so this comes out to be x to the fourth minus our bottom y function, our bottom function is 1, so 1 squared is 1, over 2 dx. You pull out the 1 half, you integrate from 1 to 2 of x to the fifth minus x dx. This is 1 half x to the 6 over 6 minus x squared over 2, evaluate it from 1 to 2. And so you get 1 half of, and then you plug in 2, and you get 64 sixth minus, well, 4 halves, but that's 2, minus what you get at 1, which is minus so you get minus one six minus a half. This all is coming out in kilogram meters again. And I'm not going to work this one out, but you get the y component of the moment, and then you divide by the mass, the total mass. So whatever you get for the y component of the moment, y bar, that's the, what we get. We just haven't simplified it. It's the y component of the moment divided by the total mass which is 9 fourths kilograms. And you get whatever you get. Um, it may not be so obvious this time where, you know, that it's far one way or the other, like where is it along here. Um, there's a lot more mass over here, and those y, the, um, the y bars of each of those strips gets higher as you move over there, so you might suspect it's higher. On the other hand, there's looks like there's more mass down here, so you should work it out. Um, I would like to do a centroid calculation and one more, and then do one calculation involving solids, and then that will have definitely been enough for this section. So let me do a centroid of a triangular metal plate. So, suppose we take just a line through the origin of arbitrary slope. So we take y equals mx, and we'll go from 0 to b, and assume that we have some metal plate of constant density. Of course, that's what you'd say if you're thinking of the problem completely physically. But we know that the density will cancel out of the calculation, or if I haven't emphasized that, I will now. The density will cancel out of the calculation, and what we're going to find is the x and y components of the centroid. And a lot of people wouldn't bother saying it's a thin metal plate of constant density. They just say, take this triangular region and find the centroid. And you're supposed to know that's the same problem as taking some physical object that has some density, but the density is constant. You know it's going to cancel out, so why bother mentioning it in the first place? And why talk about it being a metal plate? So let's do this. Um, you may know the answer to this. I don't think it's, the knowledge is that common, but we'll see what we get.
So um, because it'll be interesting in a minute, let me put when x is b, y is mb. So this top y coordinate is mb. All right. So the mass. I'm, I'm going to calculate mass in moments, and then we'll see the density cancels out. So the mass is the integral from a to b of this area density function, but we're assuming it's constant. So maybe I'll write that over to the side. Delta a, it's a constant, something greater than 0. And you take this area density function times little blobs of area, which is f of x minus g of x times dx. But so this is a constant. You can pull it out. The integral from a to b. Our top function is y equals mx. So this is mx. Our bottom function is just where y is 0. Looking at the x-axis down there. So minus 0 times dx. And so what we get is this delta a times, um, you get the m is a constant. You pull that out. That's x squared over 2. Evaluated, ah, this is from, sorry, we started at 0, not a. Evaluated from 0 to b. And so we get delta a times m squared over 2. That's what we get for the mass. All right. Um, notice that, I, I, I should say this, once the density is constant, what is this thing? That's, that is the area of the triangle. Right? Once the, understand what we're doing, the mass is the integral as x goes from a to b of the area density function times little blobs of area. If the area density function is constant, then you can just pull this out as delta a, but then you're adding up little blobs of area. So you're just getting the total area. This just comes out to be delta a times the area. So we didn't really need to do an integral to find this mass. It was the area density function times the area of a triangle. But we know the area of a triangle. It's 1 half the base, which is b, times the height, which is one of the reasons I put in the height. It's mb. Right? So you get 1 half mb squared. Great. Integration works again. So fine. What about the x component of the moment? Well, we didn't waste our time exactly setting up that integral, because that's the integral of dm. And we know to find the x component of the moment, we just multiply by an extra x in the integrand. So the x component of the moment, well, a minute ago when we found the, the total mass, we, we had the integral as x goes from 0 to b of mx, or delta a, mx, dx, you multiply that times an extra, right? This is all dm. Um, of course, I've got m for the slope now, so I hope that's not too confusing. But um, all right, you, but delta a is a constant, m is a constant. So you pull out the delta a and the m. You get the integral of x squared dx. That's x cubed over 3. You evaluate from 0 to b. And we get delta sub a m b cubed over 3. So what's the x coordinate of the center of mass? It's this x component of the moment divided by the mass, which is, again, delta a, but then times the area of the triangle. The delta A's cancel. The M's cancel. Uh, a B squared cancels with a B cubed. We end up with, uh, you invert this, multiply, you end up with 2 thirds B. So that the X coordinate of the center of mass, you go out 2 thirds 
of the way it to be, and the x-coordinate of the center of mass is here, two-thirds of b. All right, what we're going to see, just, and you can do this kind of by symmetry of the triangle, is that, yeah, the, uh, the y component of the center of mass better be kind of two-thirds along, but it's two-thirds in the other direction, so we're going to get actually one-third of mb. We'll see this in a second. I'll chop this into three pieces. Three pieces. And what we're going to find is that the y-coordinate of the center of mass is also, kind of, you know, it, they're both one-third of the way from this corner. Right? Two-thirds from that end and one-third, but you know, both two-thirds of the way from this corner. But let's see that. So the y component of the centroid, uh, well, sorry, of the, uh, sorry, the, the y component of the moment, let me do this first, is you integrate from 0 to b, same dm, delta a, mx, dx, but here you would put the y-coordinate of the center of mass of the strip at, at a given x-coordinate. But that is mx plus 0 divided by 2. So you get an mx over 2 here. Or using our memorized formula, you're getting f of x squared minus g of x squared over 2 times delta a. Delta a is a constant. You pull that out. m squared over 2 is a constant. You can pull that out. And you're left with x squared, that integral, x cubed over 3, and you evaluate as x goes from 0 to b, we get a delta a m squared b cubed over 6, but, or, and we find y bar is that, divided by the the mass, which is, hasn't changed, it's delta A m b squared over 2. Again, the uh, m. Uh, where did I get? Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. Fine. Oh, no, that's, everything's fine. Okay, so a delta A cancels. Uh, one of the m's cancels, so we get an m, a b squared cancels, b, you get an mb, and then you invert this 2, and you get, so that's, you get a third. So we get mb over 3. I was temporarily confusing that m with mass. Yeah, I told you that would cause trouble. Look, mb over 3, that's what I said we would get. Great. Okay, I want to do one last example and this will be of a solid object. You have to have lots of symmetries to find the center of mass, but finding one component of the center of mass is something we can do easily with one variable calculus, or reasonably easily. And um, if there's enough symmetry, we can get the other coordinates of the center of mass from the symmetry. In particular, <laughs> If everything's kind of circular, that helps. So let's look at one last example. I am um, going to turn a cone upside down, just because it makes one formula look nicer. So I'm going to take a right circular cone. So the base lies at some z-coordinate, which I'll call h for height. I'm assuming the, it has an axis of symmetry along the z-axis, and that the radius of the base is some capital R. So we're here at some h-coordinate. What I would like to do is 
find the centroid. So I'm assuming constant density. So the density will cancel out of the calculation, and we'd like to find the centroid. Well, just by symmetry, we know the x and y components of the center of mass. Everything's completely symmetric about the z-axis, so in terms of x and y. So the, there's no choice. x bar, the x coordinate of the centroid, this has to be 0, because right? that's the x and y coordinates of the center, this thing. And the y coordinate has to be 0. Our question is, what's the z-coordinate? Now, we could find the z-coordinate of the centroid, or even center of mass if we were given density. We could find the z-coordinate if we knew that the density was constant as a function of z. And, but unless we have some symmetries or some more data, we wouldn't be able to find the x and y um, coordinates of the centroid. So what's z-bar? Well, z-bar, you would take the integral as z goes from 0 up to h. So you would go from 0 to h. You want, so this is z equals 0 to z equals h, of the z-coordinate times how much mass is there, divided by the total mass. So the integral as z goes from 0 to h of dm. What we need is an expression for dm. Well, dm is density. Now, honest to God, density, you know, mass per volume, so just normal density, times dv, where this is an infinitesimal amount of volume at a given z coordinate. So all this needs to be a function of z for us to do it. And so what we're thinking so we're thinking of taking z cross sections, so these disks filled in circles, and you thicken them a little in the dz in the z direction to get an infinitesimal little volume, which is what? Well, it's the area of this cross-sectional circle, which has some radius, little r. And that infinitesimal amount of volume would be the area of the cross-section times dz, but the area of the cross-section would be pi r squared dz. But our question is, what's r in terms of z? For that, for that we have to calculate something. But for right now, let me just write that dm is delta of z, a little piece of volume at a given z coordinate, pi times this radius, which is a function of z squared, times dz. We are assuming, we're looking for the centroid. We are assuming this is constant. So I'm going to not write of z. I'm just going to write delta, and delta is a constant. Greater than 0. Well, I can go ahead and put that, in fact, I didn't even need to go to pi r squared dz to write what I'm about to write. You get the integral as z goes from 0 to h of z times delta dv divided by the integral as z goes from 0 to h, something that looks exactly the same except the z is missing, times delta dv. But the point is, delta is a constant. You can pull it out here, you can pull it out here, and they cancel. And as long as you've got this fraction here, you don't need the deltas. And so what you can do, now, don't, I, I changed the numerator. I changed the denominator. But the fraction doesn't change if I cancel those deltas. And now, in this denominator, this is the sum of all the infinitesimal pieces of volume, well, that's just the total volume of this cone. And we know the volume of a cone. It's one-third the area of the base times the height. So it's one-third pi r squared h. We don't know this quantity offhand. Um, but we do know the volume of a cone. So what do we need? We did this in the section where we found volumes, where we found the volume of a cone. We need this r as a function of z. Um, but we can use similar triangles for that. This triangle 
this big triangle. This big triangle is similar to this little triangle. But the big triangle has, that's R, this is H, and in the little triangle, we have R, and here's the Z coordinate. This height is your Z coordinate. <laughs> Tell my diagram so messy, but let me write it as, so what we're getting is the ratio of R to H, capital R to capital H, is the same as the ratio of little r to z. <clears throat> Actually, since z can be zero, maybe that's a, may, you know, really, strictly speaking, that's not a good way to write it. Let's write it the other way. z over r, z over r, uh, the ratio of z to r is the same as, uh, what am I saying? r could also be zero. OK, just so I'm never dividing by zero, even though this problem would go away. Let's we'll do the ratio of z to h. I just don't want zeros in my denominators ever. The ratio of z to h should be the same as the ratio of r to capital R. <laughs> now multiply both sides by capital R. So we get um, little r is r over h times z. And so. You might kind of think that a cone looks vaguely triangular. It's just a triangle rotated, and it is. It's a solid of revolution. It's a triangle revolved around the z-axis. And so you might think, after we did the last example of centroids of a triangle, that the answer is that the z-coordinate of the center of mass is one-third of the way from this base, so from the big end. That is not what will happen. And so we want to see this. Um, so what have we got? We've got z bar equals, let me write what's over there on the other board. We've got the integral from 0 to, uh, as z goes from 0 to h of the z coordinate times, well, we had little blobs of mass, but we canceled the density times little blobs of volume divided by the total volume of the cone, which we'll go ahead and use. We know that's one-third there, the base, which is pi capital R squared, times the height, h. But now we write that this is the integral from 0 to h of z times dv pi r squared. So we get pi. We just found little r in terms of z is capital R over h times z. So pi r squared times dz, and all this still needs to be divided by one-third pi r squared h. All right, what do we get? You pull out a pi r squared over h squared. You get a pi r squared over h squared. You have to integrate from 0 to h. Um, so we have a z and a z squared, so that's a z cubed dz, all divided by one-third pi r squared h. This is just z to the fourth over four evaluated from zero to h, so we get a pi r squared over h squared times z to the fourth over four evaluated from zero to h, h to the fourth over four divided by one-third pi r squared h. <laughs> what do we get? Lots of stuff cancels. The pi's, well, let me go ahead and cancel. There's an h to the fourth divided by h squared. Um, so we get an h squared here. A pi cancels. The r squareds cancel. Um, you can divide by another h, so you get an h, and then you invert this and multiply, you get 3 fourths h. <laughs> That's the z coordinate. 3 fourths of h, it's 1 fourth of the way from this big end, not 1 third of the way. It's 1 fourth of the way. So that's what we're getting in this example. 
All right, that's enough examples of calculations of centers of mass. Um, in the next section, we'll do some other applications that, that, um, um, of integration. <laughs>